Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, why doesn't the Global South support the war in Ukraine? Our guest, Christian Meta, is a former partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers and worked in their New York, London, and Tokyo offices. Christian is currently a senior global justice fellow at Yale University, co-teaching a course on global trade, tax, and social justice. Along with his wife, Christian is co-founder of Asia Initiatives, an organization devoted to women's empowerment in Asia and Africa. Christian also serves on the board of the Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver, the Nation Fund for Independent Journalism in New York, the Center for Citizen Initiatives, the American Committee for U.S.-Russia Accord, the Human Rights Watch Foundation in Japan, and Save Life Foundation in India. Uh, quite a resume. Christian Meta, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for everything you've been doing for years. Um, so you've written a great article. We'll put a link up at talkworldradio.org about why much of the global South is not automatically supporting the West in Ukraine. Um, what exactly are voices in the global South saying? David, basically the global South is making a plea for peace. They want to stay neutral, they don't want to feel the flames of this war in Ukraine. They are affected severely by this war and, and they feel that basically taking sides will make the crisis even worse. Uh, as you know, there's been a lot of uh, concern in the West, even dismay or anger, why so many countries in the global South are not supporting the West and are not sanctioning Russia. Uh, as you know, the G7 countries are the main countries that are doing that with a population of around 700 million. But of the rest of the population of 8 billion in the world, the BRICS countries, you know, Brazil, India, China, South Africa, and many of the countries in Latin America, Africa, South Asia, are not supporting the West in Ukraine, nor are they sanctioning Russia because they feel they're staying neutral is perhaps the best opportunity for peace. And you know, there's speculation in Western newspapers and maybe they are doing this because of Russian propaganda or Russian misinformation, but that is far from the truth. I think there are some fundamental reasons why they feel this way and I'll be glad to elaborate on them, but there are basically five fundamental reasons why they are doing this. First, I think many of the countries in the global South, especially the lower income countries in the global South feel that the West doesn't really understand its problems or empathize with its problems, which are very real and have nothing to do with the Ukraine war. Second, the Global South has been at the receiving end of the colonial policies of these G7 countries, and they remember which countries stood by them during their struggle for independence and which countries helped them after independence, and it was the former Soviet Union. And even though Russia is not the former Soviet Union, it is still seen by many as an ideological successor of the former Soviet Union. I think the third reason is that these countries feel that the Ukraine war is more about the future of Europe than about the future of the entire world, but it is being made out to be like the future of the entire world, and they feel strongly about that. The fourth point is that these countries are looking to the future, and, and is the West the only game in town? Or perhaps Russia and China offer them some better alternatives for the future in the multipolar world that is emerging. And the last point I think I made in this article was that the, <clears throat> the so-called rules-based international order under which the West is, is appealing to the global South to support them on the sanctions is really a set of rules that have been made by the West to suit its interests rather than what is something that the whole world has signed on to. And when the rules can be violated to suit its interests, they're done so. And when not, basically these rules are used as an excuse to, to, to punish Russia. So in summary, I think the Global South is making a plea for peace. 
They think that staying neutral is the best option for peace. They think that taking sides and adding fuel to the fire will just risk further escalation and they want to stay out of it. Uh, wonderful summary. I hope we can talk a little bit more about each of these points, but you started out, Christian, made us saying that the, these countries of the global south and the people there are affected severely. And I wonder in, in what ways they are affected by the war in Ukraine. Well, you know, the war in Ukraine, um, David, has aggravated the, the whole cost structure in the global south. The food prices have gone up, energy prices have gone up, um, the cost of debt has most significantly gone up. I don't know if you saw a recent interview by David Malpass, who said that, uh, David Malpass, the president of the World Bank, who said that uh, the West is actually, by issuing debt to finance this war, as you know, EU has issued on, almost $800 billion worth of debt to supplement households and to supplement businesses, as a result of doing this, the West is devouring the capital from the world with its high interest rates to finance this debt. And that is putting a tremendous strain on the global South in the resources that it needs to pay its debt. Its currencies have been devalued in comparison to the Euro and the dollar. Its ability to get financing to pay for energy and uh, uh, food and fertilizer is further compromised. And it is pushing them into more extreme poverty. There was a survey done by uh, Nature Energy, which said that as a result of the Ukraine war and the higher food prices, energy prices, fertilizer prices, cost of debt, almost 140 million people in the Global South will be pushed further into poverty. So that's why the Global South is feeling very, very concerned about this Ukraine war, which they see as mainly a war for the future of Europe and not for the entire world, but for which they are paying a very high price. It seems like maybe the biggest gap or misunderstanding in what people in the West think the rest of the world believes and what the rest of the world actually believes may be around the claims to be spreading democracy and building a rules-based order and, and so forth in terms of the Western side of these wars. Uh, what does the Global South make uh, of those claims uh, from Washington? Well, I think the, the rules-based international order is used as the reason to impose these sanctions on Russia. But, you know, the West takes a little bit, uh, the Global South, I think, takes a little bit more nuanced view about this because, you know, they ask themselves, do these rules actually even apply to the West? For example, uh, you know, the countries that were invaded by the West, by NATO, in the recent last 20 plus years, whether it is, um, you know, the former Yugoslavia, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, the insurrection that was posted, posted in Syria, all were done under the so-called rules-based order. But these were actual interference significantly in the discourse of those countries and created tremendous instability. Then under the same rules-based order, sanctions have been imposed on over 40 countries by the West. These are not authorized by the United Nations, which would make them legal, but they are done by the West because it suits their interests. You may know that famous interview that uh, a US Secretary of State gave to 60 Minutes in which she was asked, Secretary of State was asked what she thought about the half a million children who had died in Iraq as a result of these sanctions. And she said quite nonchalantly that it was a price to be paid for the policies that we felt were appropriate as part of the exceptional nation uh, going forward. And then under these same same rules, David, as you know, assets have been frozen of countries. Venezuelan assets have been frozen. Uh, Venezuelan gold has been frozen by, by Britain. Uh, you know, more recently, uh, uh, Russian assets have been frozen. So, uh, you know, it may be nice to say that these are rule-based orders, but if they don't really actually apply to the West, then why are you imposing them on the rest of the world 
a, a region that has really not signed on uh, to these orders. Um, another example is, you know, how Assange continues to be held in prison. Under what rules are, uh, is he being held in prison? Under what rules has Snowden needed to seek exile in Russia? Under what rules based order with the Nord Stream pipeline, if Sai Hirsch is correct, sabotaged? So I think this is, this, these rules are seen by many in the Global South, David, as rules that are um, lacking in credibility and in decline, but they continue to be imposed on the Global South as a means of justifying policies that the West would like to impose. And, uh, and it's something that the Global South is not buying. I mean, I'll give you one, one more example before your next question. As you know, the West keeps on saying that under the so-called rules-based order, this is an unprovoked war. But you know, we know what happened in, 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 in Kosovo when the West recognized Kosovo and then launched the invasion in, in Serbia. And what President Putin did was recognize those districts in Donetsk and Luhansk and, and sent in his military in support of those troops under Article 51 of the UN Charter. But <laughs> The, the fact that these rules are continuously used to only justify their actions. And when other people follow a similar logic that the West has followed, then it's seen as an unprovoked war. I don't know if you had a chance to read the book or to interview my friend uh, Ben Avilo at, uh, at Yale, who wrote the book, uh, uh, How the West Brought War in Ukraine. You may have seen that book or interviewed Ben in which he explains that this is really not an unprovoked war, but it's presented as such to the, to the rest of the world. And then the sanctions are justified on that premise, which I think is quite unfortunate. Uh, extremely unfortunate. Uh, so, so Christian, Meta, does the rest of the world have to choose between loyalty and subservience to the West or to China or someone else? Or can the rest of the world lead the way toward an actual democratic order? Is that an option? I think it is an option, David. You know, you may recall in the 1950s and 60s when there was a non-aligned movement that was very, very strong and active. You know, there was Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt. There was Joseph Rees Tito from Yugoslavia, Pandit Nehru from India, Xiaomin Lai from China, Kwame Nakruma from Ghana, Soekarno from Indonesia. All of these leaders were part of the non-aligned movement that did not want to take sides with either the United States or the former Soviet Union. And they were a powerful movement. And I think what is emerging now, David, is something quite similar with, with Lula in Brazil, with uh, Modi in India, with Xi in China, who has presented some very important proposals for peace. Uh, AMLO in Mexico has also made some peace proposals. So I think what we are seeing now is that, is that there is somewhat of a resurgence of the non-aligned movement that took place in the 50s and 60s, where countries are emerging saying that, look, do not force us into taking sides. Do not think that that is the only option that we have. Uh, in fact, we want peace because the war hurts us most, more than anyone else, because we cannot finance this war as long as it takes, which the West can do. And so it is this plea for peace that is causing these countries to stay out of entanglements and causing them to perhaps replicate the successful non-aligned movement that took place in the 50s and 60s that may, I hope, create a pathway for peace if some of the proposals that have been put forward by Xi, by, by uh, the Pope, uh, uh, Mr. Modi has made a plea for peace in the past, Mr. Lula has, is planning a visit to China in the near future, I think, again, it, in the interest of peace, and hopefully, I think some of these would be successful to bring an end to this uh, very unfortunate crisis. 
how uh, how does much of the global south view china's peace efforts in the middle east as well as in ukraine are are these uh, horrific dangers to the stability and tranquility of the world or are these viewed more positively what's the what's the the opinion the opinion i think is that there's a lot of respect for what china is doing as an instrument for peace i mean the the 10 point or the 12 point ideas or proposals for peace that were put forward by Wang Yi and by President Xi during the recent visit to Moscow are seen as logical steps that can bring this crisis to an end. Uh, it recognizes the realities that have taken place. It realizes that the world is very polarized on this issue. It also understands that the history of this region, which is a conflict between Ukraine and Russia, has, has a long history that needs to be taken into account. And there is really no black and white answer to this issue. So I think the visit that President Xi made to Moscow was received very positively by the Global South because it, 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 it essentially is saying, let us not take sides. It reaffirms what the Global South has been saying but it also enables more opportunities for peace to emerge. I mean, because of this alliance, or because of this, not, I not say alliance, but because of this closer relationship between Russia and China as a result of this visit and the peace proposals that have been brought forward, at least there is some degree of hope that, that um, uh, some peace outcomes may be possible. And because China is important to, you know, it's the biggest trading partner to uh, America, to Europe, uh, to the global South. And if China can play a role in this regard, hopefully it can, it can help all the countries that are impacted by this crisis. I think another advantage of China and Russia uh, uh, coming somewhat closer together, at least in the eyes of the Global South, is that it, it, it makes possible a different alternative for the future. It, it, it enables the BRICS countries to expand. It enables the Shanghai Cooperation Council, uh, uh, Cooperation Organization to expand. All of these are regions where the Global South have a role, and it expands the trading opportunities for the global south and economic prosperity for them and i think that's why it is welcomed and if it also creates the opportunity for less dependence on the dollar uh, that also is in the interest of the global south because the sanctions that are placed on many of these countries in the south are dependent quite a bit on the dollar and if there is a disentanglement from the dollar by better relationships with China in trading in yuan and trading in other BRICS and SCO countries in currencies other than the dollar, then it is a little bit more protective of this future. So I think putting it all together, I would say that uh, the views, the initiatives of China in this regard are welcomed by the Global South and hopefully it will lead to some degree of uh, uh, a peaceful resolution. I certainly hope so. Uh, meanwhile, I seem to see a push toward war from the US and NATO and Australia and Japan and the Philippines uh, with China. Does, does much of the world see this and have ideas for pushing back against it or avoiding it? I think this is something that is a real concern. Uh, you know, what started out as a containment of Russia by the G7 is seen by many as a containment of China in, as a pathway to that containment. And with Russia pushing back, is, is actually seen somewhat positively by the Global South because both Russia and China are important to the Global South. Russia is a provider of energy and food and fertilizer to the Global South. China is a provider of financing and manufacturing and infrastructure. So uh, I, I, I think the Global South is viewing these countries are import, as important to its future. And they feel that this 
geopolitical tension to create more challenges to these countries to move away from an emerging multipolar world and to retain the Western unipolarity or hegemony is something of which the time is past and we need to move forward rather than continue to resist the emergence of these countries. And I think there's a hope, at least in many in the global south, including myself, that, that the more these countries can emerge and provide more alternatives to the West, the better it is in the interests of the global south. I think one of the one of the worst aspects of this war in Ukraine for the world and, and wars in general is the impediment they create to cooperation. Uh, it seems to me we have crises that are not optional, <laughs> climate and poverty and homelessness that are in part manufactured by the wars, and in but in part the wars are are the chief impediment to global cooperation on these non-optional crises. Does, does, does the world view the war in Ukraine in this way? Yes, yes. It's, um, the wars are making the crisis worse for, uh, uh, as I said earlier, the problems of the global south are very, very real and have nothing to do with the war. You know, their hunger and unemployment and famine, and debt service and poverty and, and so forth. And the more these wars go on, the crisis becomes worse for these countries. And um, um, uh, I gave the example of the debt service as being an important part of it. The climate crisis worsens the situation for the global south, you know, they are paying the price in a way for these wars and the impact it has on the climate. But most importantly, it really depletes the resources that these countries have for a better future because it causes an aggregation of capital into the Western economies to pay for these wars, which then leaves even less for these countries to plan for their future. So I, I totally agree with you that, that uh, uh, the war is, aggravating the situation for the global south is not in their best interest and the sooner we can bring this to a close the better it would be is there a solution ultimately that involves global institutions democratization of the un uh universalization of the international criminal court for africans as it currently is uh, or is the solution in circumventing these institutions or is it in replacing them? Hmm. Uh, David, I think you, you probably would know this more than I would. My sense is that uh, uh, many of these institutions have been monopolized quite a bit by Western interests, by EU and the United States, and, uh, you know, I, and the effectiveness of these organizations is therefore diminished. I mean, I'll give you an example. Just on the eve of the visit that President Xi made to uh, Moscow to meet with President Putin a few weeks ago, or just on that eve, the International Criminal Court came out with its warrant against President Putin, which was intended to embarrass both President Putin and Xi just on the eve of that meeting. So when international organizations are being used as, in a way, almost to manipulate or manage global prices to suit the interests of the West, then one has to ask as to whether they are really as credible and, and effective as they need to be, or they need to be replaced by some things that are more universal in its application. Um, I, I think that there is, there is a need to go back to the, the rules that were articulated under the UN Charter rather than the so-called rules-based international order by the West. Uh, there is need to uh, modernize some of these institutions. You know, one thing that is emerging that I think is very hopeful from the standpoint of the Global South is that as the financing ability of China increases, and as there are alternatives to the IMF and the World Bank that are emerging as a result of China, there is 
significant hope for the global south. I mean, I'll give you one example. I don't know if many of your listeners are aware that over the past 20 years, China has loaned almost $190 billion to 150 countries around the world, low-income countries from the global south. Now that's, you know, of the 193 countries in the world, 150 countries have received loans from China alone equal to $190 billion. That is saying something that is very significant in terms of the future financing ability that is going to be available to the Global South, which the IMF with its conditions and the World Bank with its requirements have not been able to meet in a way that was congenial or responsive to the Global South. This, this opportunity that China is now providing is, is very much welcomed by the Global South. Russia, as you know, two weeks ago, forgave about $20 billion of debt from the African countries. Now that again is something that has not happened very often in, when Western institutions have forgiven debt of this nature. So I think what is going to emerge is that more and more, either the institutions will be modernized like the ICC to meet the demands of the entire world rather than just certain constituencies, or there'll be alternative sources of, of aid and development and infrastructure that will uh, emerge that are alternatives to the IMF and the World Bank through the help of, of, of China in particular, that perhaps will be of more significance to the global south than has been met so far to the IMF and the World Bank. I hope so. Christian Meta, we have just a couple of minutes left. When China loans money to a country, how do the terms and the strings attached to that money compare with money loaned by the IMF or the World Bank? David, the issue is a complex one. And I know that um, there's been a lot of criticism also from the West of what have been some of the terms of the loans that have been provided by China. So there is no clear uh, right or wrong in this scenario. I think what is, what is happening that is a real a reality is that uh, the loans that are being provided by China are meeting some of the very significant infrastructure needs of the Global South, that without it, there are no other options available for them. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, in in, in the, one of the biggest infrastructure projects in the last century was the Aswan Dam that was built by a loan uh, from the former Soviet Union of a billion dollars. And from 1959 to 1971, Soviet Union built the Aswan Dam, providing the resources. In fact, that loan was eventually forgiven. And that $1 billion, which the Soviet Union could barely afford, was very important to Egypt's prosperity. India received uh, uh, the largest infrastructure project from the Soviet Union was the Bhilai steel plant in post-independence India. That again was critical to India's future. So I think what China is providing is very important infrastructure needs of the global south. The financing of these are being renegotiated. I know that because the West is not providing the same resources to these countries, there is some criticism of what China has done. But in the big picture, I think I would much rather have those resources available to the Global South, even if some of the terms have to be renegotiated later or reconsidered later. But they're coming from, from good intentions from China, in my view, and I think are, are, are welcomed by them. I mean, another example that may be relevant is- Very, that, very quickly. Yeah, in 2021, China gave about $40 billion of rescue loans to these countries, 40 billion. The last time the US gave a rescue loan was to Uruguay in 2002 of 1.2 billion. So when these countries are in a crisis situation, they're turning to Russia and China for help. And I think that's something that the Global South remembers, both what is happening currently and from its colonial history in reducing its dependence on the West and leaning to a different multipolar scenario. Very interesting, very well said. Christian Meta, we will have a, a link to his article up at talkworldradio.org. Christian, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for inviting me. 
This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.